spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Aloha and good morning. Thanks for tuning in here on this Wednesday morning. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise for this very special one-hour edition of Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, we are shining the spotlight on the race for governor and speaking to the three leading Democratic candidates vying for Hawaii's top office in what we're calling a digital town hall discussion. Uh, and Yanji, it's a conversation that we've been looking forward to for some time. I know a lot of voters, as well as people following this race, have also been anticipating. That's right. We are so excited to welcome the three candidates. Uh, we are so lucky, of course, to have Dr. Josh Green with us, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, Congressman Kai Kahele, and Businesswoman Vicky Cayetano joining us live for the first time, all three together in one format, taking your questions. That's very important too. We want to remind you to type your questions into the comments. We will be going through those and we're going to get to as many issues as possible. Before we bring them in though, let's have an opportunity to get to know them a little better. Three Democrats, each hoping to take the helm at the state capitol as Hawaii's next governor. Dr. Josh Green was elected lieutenant governor in 2018. As the COVID-19 liaison, he led the Safe Travels program and the vaccine rollout. Originally from Pittsburgh, Green began working in Hawaii two decades ago as an emergency room doctor on the Big Island, where he still practices on weekends. He began his political career as a Hawaii state lawmaker in 2004. Businesswoman Vicky Cayetano built the state's largest laundry company, leading United Laundry Service for more than three decades before deciding to run for governor. Born in the, in Philippines, the Philippines, she immigrated, she immigrated to the U.S. To at the US age of three, age of three eventually three, making eventually her way to Hawaii, Hawaii in 1982. She's no stranger to Washington Place, having served as Hawaii's first lady along then-Governor Ben Cayetano. Latecomer to the race, Congressman Kai Kahele is in his first term in Washington, D.C. Born and raised on the Big Island, his path to politics began in 2016 when he was appointed to fill the seat of his late father, Senator Gil Kahele. He ran for Congress in 2020. Kahele is also a commercial pilot for Hawaiian Airlines and a lieutenant colonel in the Hawaii National Guard. So who will voters choose as a Democratic nominee for governor? The Spotlight Hawaii Digital Town Hall starts now. And we want to welcome in the candidate. Thank you so much for being here. And we hope that uh, you know that well. <laughs> the limits of technology. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, let's start with our first topic. And uh, before we get to that, rather, we want to uh, allow the candidates to do their opening statements. We're going to begin with Mrs. Cayetano and share with the viewers, if you could, this morning, why you're running for governor. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan and Yunji, for this opportunity to my fellow candidates. It's an honor for me to be here as we speak to our voters. You know, Hawaii is the best place to raise children. I mean, we educate them, we fill them with hope, encouragement, teach them about the culture here, and fill them with aloha. But yet, we drive them away for lack of opportunities, an impossible housing market, bureaucratic government, and a system that tells them no can do. I think we're all tired of hearing the same platitudes and political talk. Every election you hear promises like the ones you will hear today, but where are the results? There are three candidates before you, but there are really only two options. If you're satisfied with the politics as we've had, then either of the two men running against me can carry that forward. But if you're wanting more out of your government, if you want someone who will break the status quo, if you want to see action and actual progress in housing and jobs, childcare or climate change, if you want someone who listens more than talks, someone who has delivered results and led a successful business, then you'll understand why I've decided to run for governor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Cayetano. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, let's go to you. Uh, mahalo for welcoming me today, Yunji and Ryan. I so appreciate you. 
Uh, nice to see you guys as well, other candidates. More than 20 years ago, I started caring for local families here in Hawaii as a doctor in a small clinic on the Big Island in Kau. It was the honor of a lifetime. People took me into their ohana and into their hearts, and they showed me the true meaning of aloha. I ran for office shortly thereafter because I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. And I'd like to thank my wife, Jamie, who, right after being elected to the House of Representatives, has been since standing by me and supporting me every step of the way. I love her so much. If I'm elected governor, in fact, Jamie will be the first ever first, uh, the first ever Hawaiian First Lady, which I think is something quite special. I'd like to say to everyone out there that we've been through a lot together over the last two years, and I'm incredibly proud as your Lieutenant Governor of how we came through this. Uh, we sacrificed together, we worked together, we kept each other safe, we vaccinated over a million people to keep the uh, to keep our kapuna alive, and we saved thousands of lives through all of these actions. Our fight against COVID showed me more than ever, we need leaders who care about people. If you elect me governor and trust me to lead Hawaii forward, you'll know one thing from me. I'll never let you down. I'll work hard every day as I did as Lieutenant Governor. I'll never quit. I'll do the job that you elected me to do. And no matter how hard things become, I'll be there for you. Most importantly though, we need a governor who will restore hope to our state I hope that I'm that person for you. Mahalo for welcoming me. Thank you so much. And Congressman Kahele, why have you chosen to enter the race? Your statement to voters this morning. Well, you and Jade Ryan, aloha kakahiaka from my home here in Hilo. I want to mahalo you both for hosting today's Digital Town Hall and congratulations on recently being honored with two international tele awards. And I look forward to answering the questions that are on voters' minds directly today. I'm running for governor of Hawaii because I believe our state is at a crossroads. I've seen it firsthand in the state Senate and in the United States Congress. Our state faces monumental challenges that we have failed to address for decades. Public education, housing, the economy, tourism, the military. Hawaii moment is now and we cannot wait any longer for change. From Kaunakakai to Kekaha, I have met with constituents and they are frustrated. They are angry with a government that they feel is unresponsive to their needs. Many of the issues they are struggling with are a result of the lack of leadership in state level government and in state level problems. Our state has a kuleana to own these problems and to fix these problems. And so as a result, I've decided to return home to Hawaii to answer that call to service as I've done my entire life, to stand up for our working families and our communities, to bring about reform, accountability and long overdue fixes to the way politics has worked across our state for decades. It's time for change. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. Uh, in different ways, all three of you referenced the economy. So we want to start there this morning and specifically the issue of affordable housing. Uh, it's not just buying a home, even renting a home is out of reach for so many in our community, a suitable home that is. So I want to ask you and we'll start with uh, Lieutenant Governor Green. What specifically can the governor do immediately to fix this issue or at least address it head on? Well, you're right to bring this up as the first issue. It's the most important issue in Hawaii. Affordability all comes back to housing. We don't have enough nurses in our state because they can't afford housing. We don't have enough teachers in our state, 1,200 teachers short every year because they can't afford housing. This is what the governor can do. The governor can do a moonshot on housing. We have to decrease the regulations right now and the red tape on permitting. It's been a disaster at the DPP forever. We have to take that on and I will use emergency powers if necessary to do that. We have to use state land to build housing and it's more than 50,000 units that have to be built immediately. That's critical. Department of Hawaiian Homelands has to be improved. We have $600 million there to actually jumpstart housing. There are 27,000 Hawaiian families that would benefit from this if we get our act straight on DHHL. And this is personal for me. My wife, who uh, lost her mother at age nine, is no longer eligible for DHHL land because her mother, who was 50%, died uh, as a result of cancer. And so I've seen so many families suffer this way. So that's another part of the solution. We have to take on Airbnbs. Illegal Airbnbs are taking inventory out from our people that we can rent. And houses that are not occupied in the state of Hawaii should be taxed very severely. So again, that housing gets pushed back into the market. All of these things are solutions that the governor can take action right away. I'll call on the legislature in emergency terms to take this on, because if we get housing affordable, then people like my children, Sam and Maya, will be able to be here the next generation. And I want your children to all be able to live in Hawaii as well. 
Okay, I want to go now to Mrs. Cayetano. If you could address this issue, what do you think uh, the governor can specifically do when it comes to affordable housing? Well, that's one of the reasons I'm running, really, because for decades we keep hearing uh, politicians talk about affordable housing. Our system is broken, and at the heart of it is a dysfunctional process that is layered with bureaucracy that takes eternity for any affordable housing to even be to even be built. And uh, as governor, one of the first things I would do is work with the legislature to declare a state of emergency so that we can fast track and accelerate the uh, process to build affordable housing. The other thing that I think is really at the core of the uh, issue is also to look at the politics that are a chokehold on the projects that we have that we want to build. This is at the center of all the challenges that we have, and this is very key uh, to break through. I have three components in my affordable housing plan, rent to own, designated workforce housing, and affordable rentals. But with all of that, the common theme is breaking through the bureaucracy and the political chokehold in order to accelerate affordable housing. Okay, Congressman Kahele, what can the governor specifically do on this issue? You know, Yanji, housing is the foundational underpinning of a strong and vibrant community. It's necessary for a resilient workforce across all sectors, including our educators, our healthcare professionals, the visitor industry. Every facet of our government workers needs housing, and it's critical to a strong economy. Our failure to provide affordable housing for decades has left families broken. It's leading to the brain drain, where the next generation is looking to leave Hawaii because they've lost hope. Uh, they don't believe that they're going to be able to afford housing uh, in Hawaii in future generations. As governor of Hawaii, I would issue a 100-day innovation challenge immediately to solicit new proposals to tackle our housing crisis, inviting Hawaii's residents to submit public proposals to the state, including nonprofits, state, city, county governments, and private sector partners. Elected officials and candidates running for office talk about housing. It's the number one issue in this election. But you are not serious about housing and affordable housing on the island of Oahu if you want to build a stadium in Halava. As governor of Hawaii, I oppose building a stadium in Halava. I want to build 10,000 homes in the Halava um, area, and I want to create a housing plan from, this, from the Halava um, location where the current Aloha Stadium is all the way to Waikiki. I want to redevelop state, city, county parcels along the rail line and provide thousands of workforce housing uh, within that urban, dense, vertical Honolulu sector, and I will not build a stadium in the Halava parcel. All right, tied to, of course, affordable housing and just the economy overall is tourism, our number one industry. And our next topic is going to be about managing tourism and how we move about that. Uh, you know, in 2020, uh, 2019, more than 10 million tourists visited Hawaii. And in 2020, because of COVID-19, that plummeted to just under 3 million. What is the right number and how many tourists is ideal? And how do we balance the resident's quality of life while also welcoming in visitors? Congressman Kahele, we'll start off with you. What do you believe that right number is? It's definitely not 10 million visitors a year. I mean, we saw what that did um, pre-COVID. Um, where, you know, our, our hotels um, were, were filled to the max. Uh, those visitors were flowing into our residential neighborhoods through transient vacation rental units. Our beaches were crowded. Our trails, our parks, our environment was being stressed. Our wastewater system, our food security. Um, it's clearly not 10 million visitors. The Hawaii Tourism Authority has worked on um, managed tourism and what that looks like for the state. Um, but but that is where government can set the policy for the state. And how do we create an economy? How do I how do we diversify an economy that's not reliant on tourism? You know, Hawaii is and will always have some form of tourism in our state. It's critical to our economy. It's critical to our workforce. Um, but we have to look at diversifying the economy. Otherwise, we're going to continue to depend on tourism um, for generations to come. And that is something that is um, unsustainable for the state. Lieutenant Governor Gree, we'll go over to you next. Your thoughts about managing tourism and finding that right balance. Right. So the right balance is fewer tourists that pay more into the state so that we can sustain our jobs and people can pay their mortgages. We have tens of thousands, if not actually hundreds of thousands of people that depend on their jobs in tourism but so they can pay those mortgages and pay for their kids. So here's what I'll be proposing. A climate impact fee, a 
climate impact fee that tourists pay as they come into the state of Hawaii over age 12, we should probably start around $50. That would bring as much as 500 to $600 million into our state each year. And that amount of money should be invested in preserving our environment, dealing with the impacts of climate change and building housing that is green. In other words, with solar, this solves many problems that we have. We saw already that our economy can sustain this kind of cost. We saw that because we saw people through the Safe Travels program that my team and I built, they still came even though we had 120 to $140 test that people had to get to come to the state of Hawaii. But that will decrease the number of tourists that come in at the low end. So we'll have fewer tourists overall with this additional revenue. If we don't find additional revenue streams, we're not gonna be able to do the many things that I'm gonna propose over the course of this uh, conversation and the debates that follow. We have to invest more in education and our teachers. We have to invest more in energy solutions. We have to invest in so many different things in our state that if we don't decrease the number of tourists while increasing the revenue, we're just not gonna get there. And our housing solutions will also follow. So there's a lot of things we can do on tourism. I'd also like to see us do healthcare tourism. That could bring probably two to $3 billion of extra revenue into our state while actually decreasing the overall number of people coming into the, into the state of Hawaii. We have to be more innovative. And then finally, we have to emphasize culture. The Hawaiian culture is central to everything we are. Jamie is constantly talking to me about this. I believe it deep in my heart. And if we don't pivot towards cultural tourism, then we're not really doing a service to our host culture. So I really think that's where we start. All right, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Cayetano, over to you, your thoughts about managing tourism and finding that right balance. You know, the Hawaii Tourism Authority has put out their destination management plan. I think it's important that that is a good start. But once again, we want, we want to make sure that the process with the Hawaii Tourism Authority is also not politicized. In order to get any kind of uh, decent output and a you know, good uh, outcome on any issue, it cannot get caught into politics. And that's one thing I would emphasize. The other thing is for us to really manage tourism better, we need to reduce our dependency on tourism. And in order to do that, we have to diversify the economy. But to diversify economy, you need to attract uh, businesses to come here or to be uh, to grow from Hawaii. And in order to do that, we need a better business climate, one that will work with businesses, not work in an adversary uh, situation. Hawaii has probably one of the worst, uh, you know, reputations as being a place to do business in. And we really need to uh, address that. I'm glad that Lieutenant Governor is echoing what I've said early in my campaign about healthcare tourism. That is something that I've always said Hawaii could be, the healthcare of the Pacific. And by doing that, we're also then able to elevate the level of healthcare for our residents. Thank you. We see a lot of your questions in the comments coming in from the viewers, and we're going to get to those uh, pretty soon. But first, I want to give the candidates an opportunity to ask questions of each other. Now, uh, the candidates know about this in advance. They are each permitted to ask a candidate of their choice a question. That candidate then answers, and the questioner gets to do a short rebuttal, if you will. Uh, we want to start with uh, Kai Kahele, and you can ask whomever you would like to ask a question to. Please go ahead. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. I have a question for the Lieutenant Governor about our most valued resource, our water. On December 2nd, you sent a letter to Governor Ige advocating for the immediate drainage of fuel from Red Hill to Par Hawaii, saying that Par Hawaii had offered to immediately take the fuel. I asked you over a text message on the 5th of December who you were working with at Par Hawaii, and you named their CEO out of Houston, Texas. It's worth noting that you have accepted thousands of dollars in campaign donations and contributions from senior executives at Par Hawaii. It was clear from your letter to the governor and your text to me that you were advocating to immediately drain hundreds of millions of gallons of fuel. Now, this was strange to me since at that time, we still did not know the cause of the leak at Red Hill or the scope of the crisis. What we know now from the independent review is that there are over 200 recommended fixes to Red Hill's infrastructure, of which 43 are absolutely critical to maintaining the integrity of the entire facility. The review's conclusion was that moving the fuel without addressing these fixes carries an enormous risk of yet another catastrophic failure and spill, which would devastate nearly all of Oahu's freshwater supply, permanently destroying the aquifer for generations. Erratic decision-making and a rush to judgment to drain the fuel immediately to Par Hawaii could have made what was already a crisis of astronomical proportions even worse. 
Imagine millions of gallons of fuel blowing out of faulty pipes and valves due to a hasty and uninformed decision. And further, it's worth noting that Par Hawaii will make millions of dollars from taxpayer dollars from holding this fuel. So my question to you, Lieutenant Governor, is jeopardizing the safety and security of Oahu's precious vi, our water, for the benefit of your big donors, trusted and caring leadership to you? Well, thank you for that uh, question, Congressman. Uh, first and foremost, let me say that I was acting governor when Red Hill's uh, disaster reared its ugly head. And I went straight to Red Hill to meet with families, to make sure they were okay. And then immediately from there, went and spoke with the top brass in the military to demand that they shut down Red Hill and that we began the process, which we knew for many years before ultimately needed to happen, that was to drain Red Hill. To come up with a solution immediately is leadership. To come up with a solution to move that fuel into a safe space above ground, which is exactly ultimately what you and the other uh, members of the congressional delegation called for, was leadership on the spot. I was far ahead of anyone else on that, and I'm proud that we made that decision. Now, of course, it's unfortunate and disappointing that you bring in uh, to this question an accusation of taking donations from an individual to make a decision. Uh, because if we're going to be honest, I should set the, the record straight, your entire career has been built and predicated on taking money from special interests. The years that you spent in Congress, over 70% of your money came from corporations and PACs, as recently as April, you were raising money for your super PAC. You raised in that month about $5,000 from Microsoft and I believe it was Nike Corporation. So your record really has no credibility, unfortunately, on this matter. But what I do is I go to problems. And let me tell you why we asked PAR Hawaii to step up. Number one, there's a reason for them to move into a different discipline because we don't want them carrying fossil fuel in the future. We're trying to get to an energy neutral place and only renewables in our state. Number two, I think that you probably weren't engaged at this time uh, in politics, or you weren't engaged certainly in this crisis, but the people of Samoa were undergoing a disaster. They had a measles epidemic that broke out, and Par Hawaii provided fuel for the planes for us to fly over and vaccinate 36,997 people, children mostly, to keep them from dying from measles. That's how I knew them. That's why I had a relationship with them and how I knew that we could rely on them over time to hold some of that fuel above ground which is the environmentally right thing to do. So I hope that going forward, instead of making accusations against one another, we'll actually talk about the issues. That's a better way to uh, help this debate along and represent the people. Have, you taken, have you taken thousands of dollars from Par Hawaii senior executives, yes or no? Uh, I have had donations from 3,865 people. Uh, par that executives are, if you can I, stop I, interrupting I, me, if you can stop interrupting me, Congressman, I'll be able to answer. Uh, with thousands of donors, people have placed their trust in me. And I will work with anybody that will help solve a problem. To eliminate anyone who could solve a problem, whether that's someone who donated to you or not, would be to disadvantage us from helping the people of Hawaii. Ultimately, I do believe they will store some of the fuel above ground. And I'll work with anyone that can help the people of Hawaii. I don't believe the First Lady or myself have taken any donations, thousands of dollars of them from Par Hawaii. Mr. Lieutenant Governor, you have, and you're erratic decision-making and rush to judgment in the infancy of this crisis could have been catastrophic for the island of Oahu and three quarters of its entire freshwater supply. If that's the type of leadership that you're going to display when this state is facing a crisis, that's not the type of leadership I want for my children. I'm Lieutenant sorry. Governor, very quickly, and then let's move on. Uh, yes, so I understand um, that that's his opinion. And I would say at the same time, taking money from uh, Mr. Mitsunaga or Mr. Choi, who are under indictment uh, for bribing legislators here, that's probably the wrong people to take money from. And that's where the congressman got his money from uh, in the past years. But I think we really should talk about issues. We should talk about sustainability and we should talk about, like you said earlier, changing cultural tourism uh, to a place that's better for Hawaii. So we'll have lots of opportunities to talk about these things. OK, Mrs. Cayetano, let's bring you in uh, for your question to either of the gentlemen. So my question is to Lieutenant Governor Green. You, in your own words, have described yourself as difficult. Uh, Governor Ige said that you brought chaos to government, which was the reason he took you off the COVID committee in March of 2020. And it's also well known that you created a division in the Department of Health. Would you agree with me that true leadership requires the ability to bring people together to find collaborative solutions? Yes? I appreciate your question, um, Mr. Cayetano. 
what I'm very proud of is that the leadership that I did offer as a physician and lieutenant governor ultimately brought many people together in the Department of Health. And if you ask, for instance, uh, the Adjutant General, General Hara, he was very proud of our leadership together. Ultimately, what happened by taking bold, strong leadership, we were able to have the lowest rate of COVID in the country and the lowest mortality rate. We came together to vaccinate over a million people. Most of them were our kupuna first, and that prevented mass loss of life. So I used experience that sometimes you do have to step into a challenge when people are going to die. Uh, that's what we were faced with. We were faced with an existential crisis. And then following that, we were going to be devastated for a lack of economy. And so my team built a safe program, a program called Safe Travels, which has been essentially celebrated as the best program in the country, which kept those rates down and actually enabled us to reopen our economy and survive. That meant small businesses, which you advocate passionately for, and I commend you for that, were able to survive. That meant our hotel workers were able to work again. That's probably why they support me in this election. That's why all of these individuals have been rallying by me because I actually put together coalitions of people ranging from public school teachers to nurses, to doctors, to the people who build our houses. They've all come to my side during this campaign because they believe actually I do provide collaborative leadership. Now you use the word difficult. I use the word actually responsible, responsible for saving the lives of the people of Hawaii during this crisis. Mrs. Cayetano, do you have a response? Yes, I just want to say that I'm using your words that yourself, that you described yourself as difficult. And I would say that there was a point where there was a lot of confusion in the messaging, which added to the frustration of the people. And I think there's no doubt that uh, you played a role in that. But thank you. Uh, Lieutenant I, Governor, the, the uh, candidates, the, your opponents have asked questions of you. Now you get to choose to ask questions of one of them. Yes, and, and I was the most... Uh, relevant communicator as a physician during that time of crisis. That's why I was communicating. Probably difficult for my wife, Jamie, because it was a very stressful period, but much love there to her. Uh, I guess, let me see. I, I've spent a lot of time walking door to door over the past year. People are telling me that they are very worried about surviving in Hawaii. They're very worried about what they can do to keep their children here. And so this will be a question for Mrs. Cayetano. Uh, in your years uh, in the past, you were the leader at the Chamber of Commerce, and you fought against workers' rights constantly. You fought against living wage. Your group was against paid family leave. There were lots of bills where people could get rid of other workers uh, when businesses changed hands. And there were, even issue, there were even issues where you weren't going to protect people from discrimination by their superiors in the workforce. You fought against these bills as the head of the chamber over and over again, and people are suffering now and they're very worried. They're working two jobs and they don't have a way to take care of their children. I, I just would like to know what you would share with them because next time I'm walking door to door, they're probably gonna ask me again. Well, I hope you will stop uh, spreading that misinformation, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, I was the chair of the chamber for one year when Jim Tollefson was the president. I remember distinctly that year telling Jim Tollefson that there is no way that the chamber should continue to oppose increases in minimum wage, period. And so what we did was look at and successfully lobby for an adjustment in the unemployment insurance, which helped a lot of small businesses. At that time, the uh, economy was very strong and we were able to do that. So please don't go around spreading such lies. I've never been employed by the chamber. I was the chair for one year and Jim Tollefson remembers just exactly what I said to him. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor. Well, all I can say is we have bill after bill after bill while uh, Mrs. Cayetano was a leader at the chamber and none of them were pro-employer, pro-worker. They were all meant to scuttle workers' rights and scuttle their abilities to survive. And things are tough enough in Hawaii, so I don't think anyone's going to buy that, honestly. But if we're talking about spreading rumors, I, I do think ultimately she's going to have to look in the mirror because uh, there's been a super PAC that her family is running and her business associates, someone that she was doing, a, um, I think, a fancy purse company with, and they are running uh, super PACs. They are smearing me openly in the paper and they all know about it. It's unfortunate because that's not where we should go as a, as a campaign or any, any way uh, in Hawaii. That's not what people believe. So, you know, I'm hopeful that she will be more positive going forward with her team. But all I can do is control what I can control in my campaign. Mrs. Right, Caetano, we're going to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. 
Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna move. Uh, Mrs. Katana no, will allow you just a, a, a I short. I think I should have a chance to respond. A, a short response. response. Yeah, I absolutely hate negative campaigning, and I can assure you and the voters that I have and my campaign has had nothing to do with the ads. But you know what's the irony of this is that the unions that support you, they've actually done a smear job on me. So please look in the in the mirror before you start making those kind of comments. Right, we're going to move on. We have a lot of different topics that we want to get to. Uh, the next topic obviously addresses something that all leaders in a community have had to deal with over the past two years, and that is COVID-19. Uh, there has been a lot of evolution in policies and decisions that have been made during this time, but we want to focus on some of the decisions that are being made right now on COVID-19 and moving forward. Last week on this program, we spoke to the superintendent who said he continues to have discussions with the Department of Health on whether or not to continue the mask mandate in schools. And so our question is, do you support and do you think that mask mandate should continue to be enforced in public schools? Mrs. Caetano, we'll start with you first. You know, I think for children, it's extremely difficult to have the mask on uh, all day. Uh, I have a grandson who's on the spectrum and to not be able to communicate normally is just a real hindrance to his progress. I can't believe that with technology as we have today, uh, that we can't find other ways to be able to allow our children to attend school, not have to wear the mask and still be able to keep them and the teachers safe. All right, thank you. Uh, we're gonna move on to uh, Congressman Kahele, your thoughts on mask mandates and its requirement in schools moving forward. Uh, I would not support continuing the mask mandate in our DOE schools. I think that is something that uh, at this point, we have now been living with COVID for almost three years. Uh, that's something that a um, individual should have a choice to make and a parent should have a choice to make. Um, of course, if you're sick, wear a mask. And we now, after living with COVID for almost three years, understand the type of personal responsibility we need to take. Uh, but as someone who has young daughters that go um, to Navahi Okalaniopu, the Hawaiian Public Charter Immersion School here on Hawaii Island. It's, it's very, very challenging um, for our kids at school. Um, so if your kids are sick, um, encourage them and have them wear a mask. But that's something that we should not be mandating in our DOE public schools. And working together with the Board of Education and the state superintendent as your governor, I would put that to an end immediately. And Lieutenant Governor, your stance on mask mandates in schools. Thank you. And it was my responsibility to handle much of the COVID response. So uh, let me say this. I do not support any further mask mandates for children. I think that because the rate of hospitalization for children has been utterly low, almost zero, and in this phase of the COVID pandemic where it's become less virulent, we are okay. Uh, we're okay for children. Their development and their needs outweighs uh, the mask wearing in schools. There are a lot of other things we should still be doing with COVID. We should still be encouraging people to get booster shots. That decreases the mortality rate, decreases hospitalization rates. And that's something that my team and I have worked on passionately with the Department of Health and everyone in, in government. Uh, this has been an extraordinary experience. And I've been honored to see that our state has had the best response against COVID. But it is time to lift the masks as we go into the new school year. Uh, I have two children. Uh, Sammy actually caught COVID and was home for a time, but he never had symptoms. And I think that's something that we should reflect on. He tested positive, but he didn't get sick. And that's generally been the case for children. You know, we want to continue on with COVID-19 and follow up on another policy that has been implemented. And that is with uh, the vaccine mandates that really has caused a lot of discussion within our community. Uh, Governor Ige has kept the vaccine mandate on for new hires that enter the state, while Mayor Blangiardi uh, has dropped it for new county hires. Oh, starting off with you, Mrs. Cayetano, who do you think is right in this? Do you believe that a vaccine mandate should be required for state workers moving forward? I think that vaccine mandates make sense in certain uh, professions, certain jobs, like in hospitals. Uh, I don't think that, I, I think that's what you have to look at is the common sense of whether one should have the, the uh, vaccine mandate in the job that they're in. Uh, with respect to county or state workers, once again, I think you have to look at what profession they're in. But if not, I would not be looking at uh, uh, requiring that, no. Congressman Kahele, your stance on this? No, I do not think we should have vaccine mandates uh, in our workforce. Um, I think this, you know, we've learned a lot from, from COVID. Uh, we went into this, um, you know, two years ago um, with so much uncertainty. Um, dealing with a global health pandemic that we had never seen before um, and, and how severe it was. 
Um, but where we are today uh, with the vaccine that has is widely available, um, I've taken a vaccine. My wife, my children are fully vaccinated. Um, but I would not continue any mandates uh, requiring vaccine mandates or, or vaccinations, mandatory vaccinations. I believe it should be your choice. Uh, in, in the military, I didn't have a choice. We had to take the vaccine. Um, and I would encourage everyone to take a vaccine. The vaccine is safe. And, and I believe it uh, can help prevent or at least mitigate the effects of COVID-19. Um, but at this point, uh, that should be something that should be left up to the individual. And at the same time, it's something that the governor should work together with our public sector unions. And it should be part of uh, the collective bargaining agreement and, and the governor should convene uh, union leadership, uh, union representatives that represent our public service employees and workers to come to an agreement on how to move forward. And Lieutenant Governor, your, your thoughts on this? I, I think this, this may come as an interesting statement to you, uh, Ryan and Yunji, but I never supported vaccine mandates. I always supported vaccinations through science and through convincing people as a physician, family physician, I convinced people along the way as a messenger for this vaccine that we should get it and we'd be safer. And I'm very proud of the, the program that we put together. I don't know if people are aware, but right now, 77.8% of all of the residents of the state of Hawaii are vaccinated. That's 12% higher than the national average. 85% of all the people that are eligible have been vaccinated running right up to the time where younger children have been offered the vaccine in just the past few weeks. We consistently were ahead of the nation just through advocacy, through explaining good science. And that's what I did with my whiteboard. That's what I did with people all across the state. Then we set up pods with our other leaders in the Department of Health and across the state. And I went to churches, whether it was the Korean church or the Samoan community or nursing homes. I went and vaccinated people myself to help them get uh, safe, to both lead by example and to set the policy. But it wasn't through a vaccine mandate, which I knew would alienate other people. Very ironically, a group of protesters ultimately protested outside my home because I was the lightning rod and I was happy to be the lightning rod on this matter, uh, though it wasn't actually my policy. So uh, to the comments earlier about being disruptive or, or being out of step with the governor, I, I took that one because I thought it was appropriate that if people look to me as a leader in vaccinations, I would keep a stiff upper lip and then continue the effort to vaccinate people to keep them safe. I even advocated for those protesters to get vaccinated because I was really afraid they were gonna get sick. And that's what happened. The leader of the protest ultimately got very sick with COVID and disavowed that movement. So that was what leadership really is. And I'll continue to lead in that way. Let's move on to another uh, very controversial issue for many in our community, and that is Mauna Kea and TMT. I'm asking you a yes or no, for an a yes or no answer to a question that is admittedly very complex. But first off, yes or no, should TMT, should the 30 meter telescope be built on Mauna Kea on Hawaii Island? Uh, and your reasoning for that answer, Lieutenant Governor, we'll start with you. Well, I hate to, uh, I hate to deny you a yes or no answer, but I'm gonna do it. Uh, to ask for a yes or no question. Do I believe in science? Yes. Do I believe in astronomy passionately? And we sh should build, uh, big projects like the telescope, like TMT uh, in our state, but we should only do it if we can do it through a place of respect and trust. That respect and trust was not established over the many decades with the Hawaiian people. We did not keep our promises on, on housing, for example. Tens of thousands of people should have been given housing for our promises, and so should have we uh, given people the proper resources from the leases that were on Mauna Kea. So when promises weren't kept, a very passionate opposition developed. That would not happen under me as governor because I treat people with respect. It was controversial when I went up on Mauna Kea to make sure our kupuna were okay, that, that they were healthy, that they weren't suffering at the mountain. I still believe in science. I would love to see us have a project like TMT do as well as we did with the Hokulea, which everyone was able to adopt, but only through respectful listening will we ever accomplish projects like this. And that's the leader you need. That's the leader I'll be. Congressman Kahele, uh, yes or no on Mauna Kea and TMT? You know, as, as a native Hawaiian, you know, I, I, I find the lieutenant governor's uh, answer highly problematic. It's because he can't take a position. He's never been known to stand to take a position on any difficult issue. I support astronomy on Mauna Kea. I support uh, astronomy as it currently exists today, but I cannot and will not support the 30 meter telescope as it is currently proposed. Uh, I was uh, the one in the, in the Hawaii State Senate that, that led three years ago on how to address management on Mauna Kea, 
how can we move forward uh, as a community to solve the issue that's on Mauna Kea, which is not just Mauna Kea. It's all of our lands across Hawaii, whether it's Makua Valley, Kaho'olawe, Red Hill, 30 meter telescope. Uh, these are not uh, easy questions to answer. They are not gonna be easy um, issues to solve, but we need a type of leader who can navigate and who can understand the underlying native Hawaiian issues that exist in this state. And so, you know, I, I think it's, it's highly problematic and it should be problematic for the people of this state to hear their Lieutenant Governor, who's applying to be the next leader of this state, not be able to give an answer on Mauna Kea and a 30 meter telescope. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, we'll give you an opportunity to briefly respond to that. I think that over time, people will always acknowledge that a simple yes or no answer is not adequate for complex problems. I take really strong positions every day, every night, whether it was keeping people alive with COVID, diversifying our economy, solving parts of the homeless crisis. Uh, but you can't put a yes or no answer on something that's that culturally complex. I spent many years with the people on the big island, caring for them in their community. And I actually listened to them. And I think that they respect me on that island. That's why they kept sending me back to the legislature as a senator and as representative. Okay, you know, Mrs. Ryan. Cayetano, I, I, we want to move on, Congressman. Mrs. Cayetano, uh, what's your answer on Mauna Kea and TNT? I believe that we do need to recognize the, uh, the anger and the frustration that have been raised by the Native Hawaiian community. But I do believe in Mauna Kea and the 30 meter telescope and we'll do everything to ensure that we can work together to make sure that that 30 meter telescope is completed. All right, we have uh, just uh, about 10 minutes or so left and there are a number of other issues that we want to get to, uh, but unfortunately we might run out of time. Uh, and so we're calling this next segment uh, sort of a mixed plate. Uh, there will be a bunch of different questions, a, a lot of them more personal to get to know a different side of you, but we will also include some questions on topics uh, that are important to the voters out there and many of what we are seeing in the comment section that are coming in uh, through this conversation over the past hour or so. And so we're going to ask for your responses to be somewhat short, limited to words, because we want to get through as this as, as quickly as possible in sort of this lightning round format. And so our first question here in this mixed plate uh, discussion, we'll start off with you, Congressman Kahele. Do you support legalizing marijuana here in Hawaii? Yes. Perfect. Great. <laughs> quick, quick response. Uh, we'll go over to you, Mrs. Caetano. Recreational or medicinal? Medicinal, yes. Recreational, no. Okay. And uh, Dr. Green? Yes, I do. And I think the resources that we get from recreational marijuana should be used to support law enforcement and drug treatment and behavioral health challenges when people have depression or mental illness. That's the way to improve our mental health system. Okay. Mrs. Cayetano, you get the next one first. If you had to include one of your, oh, both of your opponents in your cabinet, where would you assign each one? Well, for Congressman Kaheli, without a doubt, it would be in uh, Department of Hawaiian Homelands. He has a passion for that, and I think with his uh, feistiness and knowledge, he would be of great help there. With uh, Lieutenant Governor Green, I think that he can assist in the areas that we want to do, which is to expand health care. Okay. Uh, Congressman Kahele, where would you put Dr. Green and Mrs. Cayetano in your cabinet? You know, we, we have two uh, very qualified individuals, um, and I believe uh, the First Lady, um, could lead the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism as a um, small business uh, owner and uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, with his you know, years of medical experience um, in Hawaii, lead the Department of Health. OK, and Lieutenant Governor, same question. Sure. Well, very good people. Uh, let's see. Um, Mrs. Cayetano, definitely DBAD and probably expanding some markets for us uh, in Asia and bringing economic development to the state of Hawaii. I think that would be something that would be in her wheelhouse and she would be excellent at. And then uh, for Congressman Kahele, maybe tag. You know, uh, he's got a lot of military experience. I believe he's recently joined um, the, the military war college and that will give him extra expertise over the next couple of years as he gets that training there. Um, but he would then uh, likely be a respected leader in the military. Uh, and he has other skills, of course, as well. We were uh, serving as friends in the Senate for many years. All right, next question moving, we'll start off with you, Mrs. Cayetano, on this response. Should the governor elected for each of their parties be able to choose their running mate for lieutenant governor? I think so. 
Okay. We'll go over to you, Lieutenant Governor Green, your thoughts on the governor being able to choose his or her running mate. I'm going to say no, because I probably would have never existed as Lieutenant Governor if that had <laughs> happened. Uh, and I like the idea of the people getting to put some diversity in the, ca in the cabinet and in the place of the Lieutenant Governor. I will say this, uh, if I'm chosen as governor, I will have an extremely close relationship with whichever Lieutenant Governor gets elected, because I believe in using them at the uh, fullest capacity that they have. And Congressman Kahele. You know, I go back to my time at UH as a men's volleyball player, you know, Ryan, and I know you play volleyball too. We played against each other. Competition is a good thing. It, uh, it drives everyone to uh, excel and to work hard. And so I think uh, if you want to be lieutenant governor, you run for lieutenant governor. And after August uh, 13th, um, the, uh, you know, uh, candidates come together and they run as a team. And so I, I wouldn't change that. Uh, I'm interested to know, this is sort of a, it could be a life hack or something a little bit more personal. What's improved your life so much that you wish you had done it sooner? And we'll start with uh, Congressman Kahele. Oh, great question. Um, you, you know, I, I think if I had uh, an opportunity um, to, to, you know, apply myself more when I was in uh, um, uh, my early years in education here in Hawaii, it, it would have it would have helped me uh, later on in life. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm probably one of the few people you ever meet that had an opportunity to go to all three high schools here in Hilo. Um, it's great because I get invited every five years to three re reunions here in Hilo. Um, but but that was a tough time for me when, when I was a kid growing up. I learned a lot from that. And I was able to apply those uh, experiences over the last 20 years of my life. So if I had to change something or uh, do something differently, that's what it would be. And Lieutenant Governor, what's improved your life so much that you wish you had done it sooner? I wish I had met Jamie much earlier in my life. And if I had, I would have had more years with her. We've been married for, uh, we're going on 16 years. In fact, our anniversary is, is the primary election day. But I wish I had 10 years uh, more with her. Uh, as my wife, we would have had that much more adventure together and we would have been able to do even more things that are extraordinary together for the people of Hawaii and with our family. And Mrs. Cayetano, same question. It would have to be my dogs. They bring so much to my life and I wish I'd had them growing up. All right. Uh, continuing to move on here. Uh, if you can name a leader, past or present, that you respect or admire or view in that role model capacity, uh, Lieutenant Governor Gee, we'll, we'll start with you. Uh, a leader that I respect greatly, I've got to say Obama right now. I, I love President Obama and what he did and represented Hawaii. Uh, he's one of them, uh, one leader that I will always look up to. Uh, then there's also Senator Akaka. Senator Akaka was an extraordinary man and he took me under his wing in the later years of his life. Uh, he would be exercising. I exercised bes beside him. And he was just magical uh, in his ability to communicate the value of culture and uh, ohana and love in Hawaii. So those are two people. All right. Uh, Congressman Kahele. You know, Ryan, it have to be my dad, our late state senator, Gil Kahele, who um, played such a major part in my life. I wouldn't be the person I am today if it was not for him. Um, two days before he passed, uh, he asked if I would replace him in the Hawaii State Senate. You know, at 41 years of age, that is not something I was prepared to do at that moment in my life. It was just six years ago. Um, but when my dad asked, I answered the call to serve. And, and I'm so very fortunate that he raised me in Mililii, he raised me in Hilo, and uh, he taught me um, to be a proud Hawaiian. He taught me to be a proud American and to serve our country. And um, I wouldn't be here if not for my dad. Mrs. Cayetano, a leader, past or present that you respect and admire? It would have to be Patsy Mink. You know, when you look at how she changed women's lives forever with Title IX and doing it at a time really where women were still not welcomed into the uh, power arena, shall we say, and uh, her legacy lives on. She's a woman I greatly admire uh, and respect and uh, would be very honored to continue in that legacy. You know, the past DT main pack have endorsed me. I'm really honored with that. And uh, she is somebody I absolutely respect for her courage, her feistiness and determination. 
there are a number of questions here in the comments, uh, and, and several of them rely, uh, relate to corruption. We've seen a lot of corruption scandals uh, over the last year, and even in the last week or so, uh, related to former Honolulu City Prosecutor Keith Kaneshiro now being indicted. Of course, you had the cases at the ledge uh, with two state lawmakers accepting cash bribes for changes on votes. Uh, there is just this general feeling that uh, people in public office perhaps cannot be trusted. How do you restore that public trust? Uh, Lieutenant Governor Green, we'll start with you. Sure, you lead by example. You go to where challenges are, you work extra hard. You know, people sometimes have criticized me for being a doctor and a Lieutenant Governor or a doctor and a Senator, but that built trust between me and the community. So I'm above reproach uh, with people. Uh, that's how you do it. You build it one by one, one community by one community. Uh, there are many things though we should do and some have been mentioned by my opponents in this race and i think highly of some of these ideas i propose them as as well term limits is one place we could go not having any fundraising for legislators while they have bills in front of them not having any fundraising for the governor or lieutenant governor when they have veto uh, bills the capacity of veto bills in front of them campaign spending reform is also something i've always supported common sense reform like that these are the ways you restore trust but uh, being a physician uh, has been helpful to me because it is a trusted profession and people always share their their greatest concerns with me. They do trust me as a person. That's how you choose your leaders. You pick them if they've already demonstrated trust. And I hope that I've done that for people. Mrs. Cayetano, how do we address corruption in our state and government? You know, I've released an ethics plan which does call for some of the things that the lieutenant governor said, but also that Congressman Kaheli has brought up. Term limits, not allowing fundraisers when the legislature is in session, uh, having a cap on what you can raise. I think to level the playing field and to encourage people who really want to serve the public, we need to find ways to do this. So campaign finance reform and ethics go hand in hand, in my mind, in order to counter uh, the corruption that you're hearing about and you're reading about. Congressman Kaheli, how do we restore that public trust? You know, every single week, Yanji, there are a unprecedented level of indictments of elected officials, of conviction, of civil servants. And, and people in this state are sick and tired of campaign finance, of how elections are run, or of how campaigns are run. You know, for the lieutenant governor to talk about leading by example, frankly, is a joke because his campaign is funded by hundreds of thousands of dollars of outside mainland money, corporations, special interests, big pharma, max dollar donors, wealthy individuals from the mainland that want to control the economic and political life of this state. What is happening right now is an entrenched status quo that, frankly, the lieutenant governor represents, trying to hold on to this grip of power by outside mainland lobbyists of rich, wealthy individuals, and so my question is, why aren't the other two candidates trying to change? I am trying to demonstrate that you can win the highest office in this state in, on a in a different way. It is why my campaign motto is Hawaii is not for sale. It is why I'm not accepting more than $100 from any individual in this industry. It's why I'm not accepting any corporate, corporate money, special interest money, lobbyist money. And in addition to attempting to demonstrate that you can win a different way, a way that Hawaii's longest serving governor, Governor Ariyoshi, has been calling about in his book for campaign finance reform. I'm, I'm also proposing the most bold, comprehensive campaign finance and election reform policies in the history of this state that will be part of my governor's package to the 2023 legislature. Campaign finance reform, getting rid of corruption, ending the status quo is the reform that makes all reforms and challenges and addressing issues in this state possible. We have to let the lieutenant governor respond to that. Yes, I, I would say this. I'm disappointed by that attack. It's disappointing to be a hardworking physician, lieutenant governor, and be referred to as a joke. That's inappropriate, especially coming from a gentleman. And I have had a good relationship with the congressman, but uh, this gentleman took thousands and thousands of dollars from Dennis Mitsunaga, who's under indictment. He took thousands and thousands of dollars for Milton Choi, who bribed people in the legislature and are under indictment. I didn't. And so I think really that's inappropriate. I'm going to continue to try to win people over with hard work 
and with a reputation that people trust. And that's why people have decided to support me. Can I add Sorry. one point in? Uh, very briefly, we're running out of time, but very briefly. Lieutenant Governor was the state's designated point person on COVID, publicly shooting up his arm with the Pfizer vaccination, while at the same time putting his hand out and taking Pfizer donations from Pfizer, from Merck, from pharmaceutical industries, from the medical industry. That's a type of leader you're looking at right here. Someone who spends more time at the Pacific Club and has more combined fundraisers than okay, we, of our candidates running right now. Come on. And, uh, no, and, and, and after, very, very briefly. Yes. That, that amount of sensationalism to distract voters is inappropriate. Uh, Mr. Kahele built his entire six-year career, which is short, on raising money from special interest. All 20 of his top donors were from corporate interest, from PACs. He's lived that life, and he's only changed his tune in a desperate attempt to distract people. I earned people's leadership by good works, and it is an honor to have the support of the medical community after providing service. Okay, okay thank you, uh, Lieutenant After Governor providing Brown. service that made us the best responding state in the country. We, okay, we, well, we were running out of time, and we do want to allow for some closing statements. Yeah, so let's start off, uh, let me see, with Congressman Kai Kahele, if you could give us a closing statement, please. Well, I really, really appreciate, you know, the opportunity to um, to meet with you today and, and to all of the viewers across Hawaii who took the opportunity to tune in. You know, I want to thank Yanji and Ryan for hosting this town hall. You know, the people of Hawaii deserve to hear from us as candidates and to ask tough questions. And I know I'm greatly looking forward to being on stage with the other candidates soon in upcoming statewide debates. This election is about what direction we want to take Hawaii. Are we going to make the necessary changes across government and leadership that will benefit our working families? Or are we going to continue with the same business as usual approach, the same lack of indecisiveness and decision making and promises that never happen? I want to provide the voters with a clear choice. And as a candidate who isn't beholden in this race, the big money to corporate special interests or mainland donors, I've launched my campaign with the slogan, Hawaii is not for sale because I believe in the power of our local working communities. They need a voice now more than ever. So again, mahalo for the opportunity to address all of you this morning. And I look forward to more of these opportunities soon. Mahalo. Lieutenant Governor, a final word from you. Sure. Uh, thank you again, Yunji. Thank you again, um, Ryan, for welcoming us to Spotlight. This year, we're going to choose new leadership for our state. All of us uh, will come together. Hawaii needs a governor that can bring people together, as I've been doing as lieutenant governor, to take on the biggest challenges we have. Uh, you've given me the honor to take on the COVID crisis, and we came through this better than any other state in the country. It's that leadership that was critical, and I hope people have recognized it. I'm so honored that actually they have. As your governor, if I'm elected, I'll take the, the onus upon me to build tens of thousands of units of housing for our working people going forward. There's no question that's our biggest challenge and working families have to be able to stay in the state of Hawaii. I'll take on the homeless crisis as I've already begun, building Kauhale, getting people who are suffering greatly off of the streets, off of drugs, help with their mental illness so that we solve that crisis one person by one person. That's how you do it and that's how I've been leading. Uh, above all else though, I'll do everything I can to listen to you, to be honest, to be transparent every day. I will see this job to the end. I will never quit on you not even when times get tough. I will be your governor for four years if you select me. It's been an honor to be here uh, for this last hour, and I'd be humbled if you would support me in the primary election for governor. Okay, and Mrs. Cayetano will give you the last word. Thank you. Well, I hope that uh, the viewers can see that while my two opponents have been just like politicians will talking back and forth, I'm all about getting the job done because the people I talk to just want their children to be able to afford to come home. They want to be teachers and nurses here. They want to start their businesses here. They want to create art and grow food here. They want to buy a house here. They want their grandkids to be with them here. You know, I get it because I have a son whose family couldn't stay here and had to move to the mainland. So this is very real to me. And the things that drive our people out of Hawaii are not inevitable, you know, they are preventable, but only if we change course and bring about a government that works for the people. You have two choices in this election, 
stick with the politicians we've had or carve a new path of possibilities and prosperity. I humbly ask for your vote because if I am your next governor, I will devote all my skills, my determination, my leadership to bring our people back, to bring our children back, to keep Ohana together and to bring Hawaii back to the place that we all love. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Vicki Cayetano, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, and Congressman Kai Kahele for spending that full hour with us. We sincerely appreciate it. Thank you to all the viewers who joined us uh, in the comments. And uh, we look forward to the primary on August 13th. Mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo. Wow, Ryan, it flew by and we appreciate all your comments. We did our best to get to the major issues. And even though they are all Democrats, uh, you definitely heard some policy differences there on a number of issues. If you missed any part of this broadcast or want to go back and watch it again, of course, it's available on the Star Advertiser website along with the Facebook page. But you can also listen to this as a podcast uh, in your own time. That'll be up wherever you get your podcast later this afternoon and also later as a rebroadcast on Channel 50. We want to thank all of you for being a part of this conversation, as well as our candidates, and look forward to future discussions with uh, the other races that are happening in this upcoming election. We'll see you right back here on Friday for our normal half an hour segment of Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Longstrugs.